Hello everyone, how's everybody doing? I hope you're doing fine. I'll remind you that we have a um, <clears throat> the seventh rational physics conference coming up in less than a month. Those who are interested, make your reservations. Sweden, Boris, 8th of June. Okay, we always have a lot of fun in them. So, uh, your loss. <laughs> be there or be square. <clears throat> okay, today I'm going to take up again the issue of nothing. <laughs> now, how exciting is that? Talk about nothing. Talk about an hour for an hour about absolutely nothing. Now, that's that's something. <laughs> Anyways, um, picking up where I left off some time back, I lost count. Uh, I started off with uh, the standard idea that they have in the establishment that you can produce something out of nothing. Okay, and we have Mr. Lawrence Krauss, a prominent celebrity of mathematical physics. He claims in his book, A Universe from Nothing, that he can produce something from nothing. Specifically, he, uh, what he does is he um, says that he can produce um, positive energy, negative energy from zero energy. Uh, what is he saying? He's saying um, you take 100 apples and you have negative 100 apples. And then you have 100 positive minus the negative 100 and you get zero apples. Zero apples. Uh, that's not the same thing as zero pears or zero rocks or zero trees, okay? And uh, so when you have zero apples, you can divide those up back again, do the, the calculation, if you're mathematically inclined, and you'll get 100 apples here and 100 negative apples over here. And that's essentially what they do. That's, that's how they create a universe from nothing. And I've illustrated that uh, just so that we're all on the same page here and this is more or less what it looks like uh, you have a universe of uh, particles known as empty space in mathematical physics okay and the way it works is um, uh, let's wait for it to start here and you have particles and they come together uh, uh, you have energy plus energy and negative energy they come together and they create nothing Zero energy, which is empty space, a synonym of empty space in mathematical physics. Okay, and that empty space in turn is made of particles because it's vibrating energy, uh, uh, excited fields, who knows all the stuff that they've got in there. And the process can be reversed, and here we are going to reverse it now. We're going to take, um, wait till it starts here. You've got absolutely nothing, supposedly zero energy, space, and there's something in there, uh, some smoke, some ghost, and it breaks up into positive and negative energy. And then each one of these in turn can turn into particles. They, con they uh, condense or they uh, coalesce into uh, particles. Okay, So that's how they produce something from nothing. You can apply uh, Einstein's equation, E equals mc squared, and uh, the energy turns into mass. Mass is matter, right, in mathematical physics. So that's essentially the story uh, for how something is created from nothing. And so a good question is whether um, there is anything such as nothing. And for this, we have to go all the way back to the Greeks, which we did. And I'll just go through it real quick. We went and we found that there were several schools. Okay, uh, let's see if I can make this smaller. Uh, there were several schools of um, philosophy. And uh, the Greeks debated the ether specifically. Was, was there something called an ether? And they concluded that there was. It's known also as the fifth element. You had earth, uh, fire, water, and air, and then you had ether. Um, and they debated whether, you know, uh, things were made out of these elements, okay? But there was this thing called ether, which uh, was not clear what it meant. And supposedly, they, I guess they were referring to whatever was out there in space, maybe light itself. They, they had no clue. They just had... Um, assumptions okay and so they gave it a name of ether 
And the question uh, was whether the ether was, you know, um, uh, encapsulated by something. In other words, was the ether infinite, assuming uh, ether was a bunch of red particles like you see there? Uh, was it the same thing first as space? In other words, space is the white stuff there. Is the are the ether particles the same thing as space, or are they different? Is the uh, ether the same thing as space? And then uh, the question also is whether, irrespective of whether it's a bunch of particles or whether it's space itself, um, is it infinite, or is it uh, contained within that black stuff, whatever that black stuff is? And so the, these were the philosophical issues that they were debating in those days. And uh, really, uh, from them, from the Greeks, we can, um, uh, extra, uh, you know, uh, inherit, essentially, we inherited three versions. There were several schools, but you can uh, reduce them down to three. The first one is Democritus and his de atomist or materialist, and he believed that, essentially, or proposed that there were atoms in empty space. That was it. And when an atom moved, it left space behind, and also the atom moved into empty space. Uh, the Eleatics, uh, led by Parmenides, uh, he had a different view. He said there is no motion in the universe. Yeah, just like you hear it. There is no motion. There is no motion because a particle has no empty space in which to move. <laughs> So uh, he said, there is no motion. Motion is an illusion. Uh, uh, you know, you're, you're being fooled by Mother Nature. There is no motion. And Aristotle, who came a little later, uh, he took a little bit from each and he said, look, uh, there is space, uh, but there's no empty space. There is space and a particle moves to that space, but immediately the, the space it left behind is taken over by something else. And, um, you know, uh, he did not believe the ether was here on Earth. He thought the ether belonged to the gods. Uh, he thought it was either air or fire or something that occupied that space. And so these were the three ideas, the three notions that come down to us from the Greeks. Okay, okay so we have these three versions. And this lasts, essentially, uh, until the 17th century. Uh, in between, you have the Arabs, and we don't need to go into great detail with them. Um, the only thing we should really mention is they developed devices, especially in the golden age of the Arabic uh, world, from the 8th to the 12th century. Uh, they developed a bunch of uh, pumps uh, to pump water mainly, and similar to the Romans before them, you know, they, these people used pumps. They, they had a working knowledge of vacuum. They would suck things like water. And, uh, but they had no theoretical understanding. No one really debated this in any depth. Uh, is there really empty space? Is there a vacuum? That was a, a question that doesn't really pop up in, um, in a more systematic approach until the 17th century. And one way it came out was um, a fellow approached Galileo. And uh, uh, he was a scholar also, the, this other fellow. And um, he says, look, you know, I'm trying to pull water uh, over 22 feet. And the water can only, you know, I, all I can pull out is like 10 feet of water. Why? And Galileo believed there was a vacuum and he says look you suck on you know with a vacuum but the vacuum is only so powerful it cannot suck 22 feet of water it can only suck like 10 feet of water his notion was that it was the vacuum that was pulling the water out okay and um in other words uh, he had this level the, the the question was an issue of level and some someone um uh, took over this idea. He heard about the problem and he's the first guy who develops, you can say, the first vacuum. Okay, uh, Really a water barometer. Okay? And uh, th that's Mr. Gaspar um, Birdie. And what Mr. Gaspar does, he, he builds a little tube which is 30 feet long. Okay, 30 feet long. And he fills it with water. Okay, and what he does is he covers the top so that it doesn't, you know, drain. And he opens the bottom, 
he lets it drain into a uh, you know some some uh, recipient at the bottom and he realized that you know the water doesn't drop all the way it just drops to 10 feet and so uh, he said you know um, I don't know why but for sure I, I, I created a vacuum there is a vacuum in that region because I got rid of all the water in, in where the bulb is okay and this created a stir because a lot of people didn't believe that it was possible to create a vacuum they, they did not believe that there was a vacuum in nature no such thing as nothing <laughs> Everything was, uh, you know, whatever you couldn't see or touch was filled with the ether. And uh, this was the notion they inherited from the Greeks, and this stayed all the way to the 17th century. And Bertie was a little upset about that. He said, look, I created a vacuum. There's nothing in there. And another fellow that's going to, um, contemporary of theirs, uh, Mr. Torricelli, he's going to build a little better barometer. He's going to go in there and he's going to uh, use a uh, mercury, which is uh, much heavier than water. Okay, And so he was able to build the same apparatus, the same device as Bertie, but he, he does it um, in a more manageable, manageable way. He's got a little device there, a little uh, thermometer sized um, uh, apparatus there, and he fills the tube with um, mercury. He does the same trick that Bertie did and he realizes that the pressure changes and he concludes rightfully that it's the air pressure that's pulling, pushing down on the reservoir there, on the, on the flask, on the, on the water that's uh, you could say in the ocean in that little pond in that little pool and it doesn't allow the water, in, or in this case, the mercury, to drain completely from the little test tube that's in, uh, inserted in there. And so he's the first guy to figure out that uh, air has weight, weight that's pressing down on the uh, mercury there. And he does his calculations and he figures out, you know, what we have today. You know, we have all these mercury uh, barometers and thermometers and all that stuff. He's the first guy to see this. Okay, so he figures out that, and, and again, uh, Torricelli believed that he did create a vacuum. Okay, just like uh, Bertie, they, they both believed that at the top where the mercury was, you know, drained from, in that little region, he says, there, there's a vacuum, there's nothing there. A lot of people had problems with that and one of the guys who had problems with it was René Descartes. He was a French philosopher and he lived around the same time uh, and he was for the last 10 years in, uh, in philosophizing about this. When these guys come out with their experiment he said you know these guys are wrong. Uh, uh, there's no such thing as a vacuum because uh, you know whatever uh, wherever there, we create a vacuum, wherever you take something out, something fills it in. He had the same idea that Aristotle had. And this is how Descartes uh, is going to justify it. He writes uh, in his uh, famous book, where is it here? He writes um, in his uh, uh, treaty on philosophy, essentially, right? He uh, calls it the principles of philosophy. And he writes the following, he says, a thing that has a certain quantity or number isn't really distinct from the quantity or number. This is how he starts his reasoning. He's saying essentially, you know, that a thing is the, its volume, its quantity, the quantity that you're going to use to designate it. Okay. So he says, there is no real difference between quantity and the extended substance that has the quantity. Suppose there's a corporeal substance that occupies a space of 10 feet cube, 10 cubic feet, okay? We can consider its, its entire nature without attending to its specific size because we understand this nature to be exactly the same in the whole thing as in any part of it. Conversely, we can think of the number 10 or the continuous quantity 10 cubic feet without attending to this particular substance because the concept of the number 10 is just the same in all contexts where it is used 10 feet or 10 men or 10 anything and although the continuous quantity 10 cubic feet is unintelligible, unintelligible without some extended substance 
that has that size, it can be understood apart from this particular substance. In other words, the number 10 stands alone, okay? Uh, you can use the number 10 for anything, anything that amounts to 10. It doesn't matter whether you're ta talking about feet or men or apples or whatever. And here's why they aren't really distinct, he says. In reality, it is impossible to take the tiniest amount from the quantity or extension without also removing just that much of the substance. And conversely, it is impossible to remove the tiniest amount from the substance without taking away just that much of the quantity or extension. So he's saying that uh, quantity and extension are the same thing. Okay, That's how he starts his reasoning. Uh, he continues uh, with um, the f uh, uh, analyzing what a body is, okay, a thing. And he says, the nature of matter or body considered in general does not consist in its being hard or ponderous or colored or that which affects our senses in any way, like odor, for example, right? But simply in its being a substance extended in length, breadth, and depth. More or less, uh, Descartes is saying, look, an object is that which has shape, but he's not referring to shape. He's ex referring to extension. He's referring to volume. He's looking at length, breadth, really width, and height. Okay, that's what he's thinking. And he says the following. He says, the corporeal substance, when distinguished from its quantity, is confusedly conceived as something incorporeal. When they distinguish corporeal substance from extension or quantities, they, <clears throat> they either mean nothing by the word corporeal substance, or they form in their minds merely a confused idea of incorporeal substance, which they falsely attribute to corporeal and leave to extension the true idea of this corporeal substance. Okay, and this is how he ends his reasoning here. He says space is the same thing as an object, or as a thing, or as a body. Oh, sorry, wrong one. Uh, where is it? Here it is. He says the nature of matter or body, considered in general, does not consist in its being hard or ponderous or colored. Uh, hold it, I got the wrong one there. Here it is. Okay, it says, space and the corporeal substance which is comprised in it are not different in reality. Listen to his argument. The same extension in length, breadth, and depth which constitutes space constitutes body. After taking from a certain space the body which occupied it, we do not suppose that we have at the same time removed the extension of the space because it appears to us that the same extension remains there so long as it is of the same magnitude and figure and preserves the same situation in respect to certain bodies around it by means of which we determine the space. What is Descartes saying? Well, here, let's summarize what, what he's trying to say here. Here's, the, here's a, his argument in a nutshell. He says, a body is no different than quantity and units by which it is described. For example, 10 meters cubed, right? A body is extension, length, width, and height. Okay, but he says space is also length, width, and height. Extension described in quantities and units. We're talking about volume. Therefore, body and space are identical. Okay, so he's he's essentially doing he's he's doing uh, some fancy footwork uh, with mathematics here. He's saying, look, you take a body, you take an elephant, and let's say he occupies, I don't know, 10 meters cubed, 10 cubic meters of space. That's his volume. If you remove the elephant, you can't say that what remained behind was the volume just by itself. Partly he believed this because he says you, you would be creating volume every time you move something. You move the elephant, if the volume stays behind, the ghost, the, the soul of the, uh, of, of the elephant, then you created new volume in the universe. He said, you can't do that. It's, it's irrational. You can't remove the elephant and leave, you know, his shape, his, his shape behind. He said, whenever you move the elephant, you're also moving the space in, in a sense. You're, you're moving the whole thing. Or you can move the elephant, but something occupies that same space. There is no such thing as an empty space left behind uh, and I guess you got to imagine this like a train, uh, you know, with several cars. So the train moves and then another car 
fills that space. There, there's a flow of matter. And of course, you know, uh, uh, what filled matter when you couldn't see it, it was this ether stuff out there. That's what they had in, in the back of their minds. That's what they inherited from the Greeks, and that's what they postulated, okay? Okay, so um, what happens is that um, some people started looking at Torricelli's experiment, and they said, oh, let's see if we can reproduce this. And one of them was Otto von Guericke in, um, in Magdeburg around mid-century. And he goes in there, he um, invents somewhat uh, what you could think of as a bicycle pump, but it works in reverse. It just pulls air out of a uh, couple of uh, hemispheres made out of copper. He removes the air out of them and then has a few men pull on it and, sh and he shows that, you know, they can't break it open. That's how uh, strong the air pushing on it is from the outside. So he believes he's produced a vacuum in there, okay? Well, his uh, little toy uh, is, uh, um, you know, gets, gets spread around. Some uh, people write about it, and they read about it in England, in London. Okay, and who reads about it? Well, you have a couple guys. One is uh, Robert Boyle, and uh, he was a pretty rich guy, and he's got a right-hand man. His name is Robert Hooke, and they're going to do a little few experiments with this same vacuum, uh, hemisphere that Garricka did, but they, they, they want to be able to see inside there. They want to also be able to manipulate this thing. So they improve on it substantially, on, on Garricka's invention, and they play around with a vacuum. By 1660, uh, Robert Boyle writes a book on which he says, look, I've produced a vacuum inside there. He takes again Torricelli's view. He says, look, I, I produced a vacuum in there. Well, some people didn't like it. And uh, for the wrong reasons, <laughs> and you're going to see this, uh, we have, um, on one hand, we have Robert Boyle and Robert Hooke, and on the other, you have this gentleman, and he's uh, more famous for his political views, uh, but um, uh, Thomas Hobbes, he, um, he also dealt with scientific issues. He was a mathematician, okay? And uh, he taught mathematics to the princes, uh, or the prince, some some of the princes of, uh, of you know, some of the sons of the king. And uh, this is where their uh, differences lay. Essentially, this is where, what the debate was all about. On the one hand, you had Robert Boyle, who was a very religious individual, okay? And he says, look, when I do my experiment, nothing is left in the chamber after I pump it. Okay, when I pump it down. There's no ether wind or anything that remains in there, nothing I can detect. Uh, he says it is possible to produce empty space with a pump, and empty space does indeed exist in nature. And he accused Hobbes, who wrote a, a book or a pamphlet, I guess, against his book, and he answers it two years later, and he says, look, Hobbes' extreme materialism really leads to atheism. And Hobbes was known as an atheist, even though I don't think he really ever came out and said it, said it so plainly, but he was an atheist in, in all his writings. And Hobbes took a different position. Uh, he says, look, uh, first he didn't like um, someone postulating nothing, okay, and saying that that nothing was something which is what essentially Aristotle and uh, Descartes were saying. He's saying, look, uh, you either deal with nothing or you deal with something. And you can't tell me that a nothing is a something, okay? And um, so he said there is no such thing as nothing. There's only some things out there unless you can, you know, justify that nothing somehow. And I guess he was looking for a definition, which they never did uh, define this term. Okay, and he, his argument was that tiny particles of ether penetrated through the, uh, uh, through the glass enclosure that uh, Boyle had made and uh, filled the vacuum. So there was no true vacuum in there. Uh, all that the Boyle did was remove the big particles and the little particle just seeped in and filled the vacuum. So essentially the, the tiny particles that filled the uh, chamber, uh, they, they, all they did was uh, just reduce the, um, uh, the, 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 um, uh, the thickness of the environment in there. The density was lower, okay? 
And he says, um, uh, you know, those tiny particles, uh, we can't see them because, uh, you know, they, they used to do this experiment where they would put a bird in there and they would remove all the air and they would show that the, bear, that the uh, bird died. And so he says, yeah, you know, uh, Hobbes says, yeah, the bird dies because the uh, ether is not sufficient uh, to sustain the birds, uh, the bird alive. He can't breathe, uh, and that's why he dies. But that doesn't mean that there's nothing in the chamber. There's all these little particles that are not the same thing as air. And again, uh, essentially he was saying ether is not air, okay? And uh, he, he accused uh, Boyle, who was a very religious guy, he says, you know, all these people who talk about immaterial substances, uh, essentially vacuum, uh, they're, they're, they're wizards, they're loonies, they're, they're doing magic, they're not really doing any uh, science. Okay? There is no such thing as nothing. Okay, so uh, where does this take us? Well, uh, of course, uh, a lot of people in those days were debating these issues, and, and also you got to keep in mind the, the context here. Uh, what had happened a few years earlier uh, was that uh, Oliver Cromwell took over the government and he executed the king. The only king that was executed in, in England uh, was Charles I. Um, and so they, they executed him. Uh, for 10 years, you had this... Uh, period in which Oliver Cromwell ruled the, the country. He was the Lord Protector, <laughs> as he called himself. And uh, he dies. And almost as soon as he dies, you know, Charles II, Charles I's son, comes back from France, takes over the government again. Things continue as normal. In fact, it's uh, Richard Cromwell, uh, Oliver Cromwell's son, who has to leave and go to France. And when uh, Charles II comes back, you know, uh, by this time, um, they had formed this royal society, which was the scientific uh, uh, cutting edge of technology in those days. You know, these were a group of uh, people who were interested in science. They did experiments. Among them, you know, you have Boyle and Hooke. Uh, Newton eventually is going to join as well. He's going to become the leader, uh, the, the head of the royal society eventually. And uh, they formed this group. And Hobbes was left out. Yeah, he was not part of that group. Hobbes was very anti-royal society. And part of it is because uh, Hobbes was a normal, um, uh, you know, just a layman. Whereas uh, Boyle was uh, aristocracy. And so, you know, Boyle not only wanted to keep uh, as much as possible, as much as he could, you know, uh, people who were aristocrats and rich people in there, but they also went to the king and they asked to see if he would help them out with money, you know, uh, contribute, uh, patronize them. And the king, Charles II, you know, he had bigger problems on his hand, head. And he, in fact, he made a comment, which I read once, uh, that uh, he said something like, you know, these guys at the Royal Society, they've been there for four or five years. All they've been doing is studying air. <laughs> <laughs> all they did was study, you know, the vacuum air, you know, this is all they did for four or five years. And so, yeah, he gave them a few pennies, you know, he, he didn't really uh, support them. He did what the United States government does with NASA, you know, treats it like a science project and says, okay, here's a few coins, guys, you know, we got bigger problems, you know, political and military and whatever. It's great that you guys are doing something out there, but don't, don't bother us. And uh, so... Um, Essentially, that's what happened. And you have Hobbes, who was not incorporated and never was into the Royal Society, this, this group. And the Royal Society eventually is going to grow to what it is today, which, uh, you know, they publish things and so on. It's uh, one of the think tanks, maybe the number one or one of the main think tanks in Great Britain today. Okay, okay what happened? Well, what happened was that uh, you have Mr. Huygens come about this time a little after... Uh, these fellows, and uh, he he writes his book, which is uh, Traite de la Lumière, and um, in this uh, treaty, uh, some consider it the first real uh, mathematical physics book because he does a, a, a quantitative analysis of uh, light. Uh, I don't know if that's completely true because Descartes had already done something similar even before then. We had Kepler, who did something in, uh, what is it, 1604, uh, he, he wrote about optics 
and also, you know, looked at angles and refractive index and that kind of thing. So uh, there were other people who were doing analysis of light. Uh, they were looking at the ether, right? And um, uh, what's his name? Um, Christian Huygens, he's no different. He writes his book and he's going to go in there and he's going to try to analyze what light is. And of course, he falls back on the ether. So he analyzes the ether and it's interesting that he brings up, he brings up the issue of Torricelli. The fact that was there a vacuum in that little bulb at the top of the we'll call it the test tube, the upside down test tube, right? And you drain it to a certain level and is there a true vacuum in that little top bulb? Or is that filled with something called ether, whatever ether is? And he does a little analysis that puts it into a proper perspective for what's going on in the 17th century. Okay, and this is what uh, Huygens has to say. He says, the question next arises as to the nature of the medium in which is propagated this motion produced by luminous bodies. Okay, I have called it ether but it is evidently something different from the medium through which sound travels. For this, uh, later, uh, for this latter is simply the air which we feel and breathe. Okay, so he's saying sound is air. Okay, they, they had already figured that much out by that time. Okay, for this uh, later simply air which we feel and breathe and which when removed from any region leaves behind the luminiferous medium. In other words, you can remove air that removes the sound but you're not removing whatever is in there which is still a luminiferous medium. Okay, this fact is shown by enclosing a sounding body in a glass vessel and removing the atmosphere by means of the air pump which Mr. Boyle has devised and with which he has performed so many beautiful experiments. So you remove the sound, but you do not remove the light. That's essentially what, uh, what um, Christian Huygens is saying. Okay, so he's saying you... you, you um, that there's something still in there, some luminiferous uh, 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 me, uh, medium. Okay, there, there's something that remains. Once you remove the air, something remains in there. And he's trying to analyze what that is. He says, look, uh, he makes another comment. This time he mentions Torricelli. And he says the following. He says, he says, from this we infer not only that our atmosphere, which is unable to penetrate glass, is the medium through which sound travels but also that it is different from that which carries lumin luminous disturbances. For when the vessel ex is exhausted of air, light traverses it as freely as before. So uh, whether you have air or not, it doesn't affect light. Light goes through it. That's what he's saying. And so he says this last point is demonstrated even more clearly by the celebrated experiment of Torricelli. That part of the glass tube, which the mercury does not fill, contains a high vacuum, but transmits light the same as when filled with air. This shows that there is within the tube some form of matter which is different from air, and which penetrates either glass or mercury or both, although both the glass and the mercury are impervious to air. And if the same experiment is repeated, except that a little water be placed on top of the mercury, it becomes equally evident that the form of matter in question passes either through the glass or through the water or through both. Okay, so he say, look, you know, you, you, you can remove whatever you want from there, but whatever is in there, whatever still remains, or whatever medium is in this little thing that you call vacuum, there's something in there because light is it, it, it passes through there, and of course, if you're thinking of particles, then yes, you would say, look, we removed all the big particles, but we left all these tiny particles, as um, uh, Thomas Hobbes suggested. He said, we still have all these little particles in there, and those are the ones that are carrying the air, uh, the uh, light, the luminiferous or luminous uh, medium, okay? So that's what's, what uh, Huygens was saying is vibrating. And here I, I put that into a little uh, GIF, a little picture, so that you can see what I'm talking about. He's saying, look, uh, we still have ether particles in there, 
okay so you remove so the bottom is the water okay let's assume this is a water uh, experiment like Bertie did you can also put uh, mercury it doesn't matter the point is that uh, that upper part is where the vacuum is supposedly uh, inhabits right and what he's saying is look you still have something in there you have all these tiny particles and that's the ether that's the luminiferous ether because it, you are able to send light through that same region and that means the particles of light as he probably imagined them uh, can penetrate the glass and fill that region and start vibrating in there and that's why we can see light in there and here you have another uh, version of that and again it's his version uh, essentially because uh, he's saying look uh, we, we can send light through that region that that supposedly vacuum region and it carries light it, it retransmits or it allows the particles or the waves of light to go through there or to vibrate in there any way you can imagine it it's like there's still a medium in there you can't get rid of the medium that's essentially what he was saying and um well you know all i can tell you is um i'd love to do a little uh time travel go back there and enlighten mr uh, christian huygens uh descartes uh thomas hobbes all of them sure would love to uh give them a different point of view which i'm going to give you now of that luminiferous ether that vacuum so-called vacuum in there and yes there is a vacuum in there there's nothing in there no particle assuming we can achieve a perfect vacuum obviously we can't achieve it here on earth but we have evacuated that region of uh, atoms so let's talk about atoms you can remove the atoms from there from the from the inside but there's still light light going through there or light in there somehow you know you, you can send a beam right through that region and you say well you know I can see the beam going right through there like if you send a laser right and you have a reflection because remember this is horizontal to you uh, you're hitting something if, if you can see the beam sideways okay inside there and the, there are particles in there uh, there are still atoms in there even if you pump it down I don't know to 10 to the minus 12 tor which is about the best that we can achieve here on earth uh, you know if you can re achieve in a chamber 10 to the minus 12 tor you you've done a good job you know cleaning and drying and etc let's assume you achieve that level well you have very few particles in there but uh, the important thing is that you have fewer particles that you had than you had before and instead of particles let's talk about atoms. you have fewer atoms than you had before okay that's my point my point is if you had a million atoms, now you have, I don't know, a uh, hundred thousand atoms because you pumped the chamber down, okay? So now you have only a hundred thousand particles where there used to be a million particles. If you want to talk with uh, easier numbers, we can say you had a hundred particles, now you have ten particles, but you still have particles in there. But now you have fewer uh, atoms. You had a hundred atoms, now you have ten atoms what happened to the rest what is it do we have an ether there that fills the rest of that space that you where you remove the particles did something take its place something called an ether are there smaller particles uh that go through the glass or that are in there or whatever is that is that what we have because this is what the issue was the issue is when you pump a chamber down right you remove the visible particles you, or even the invisible like air you remove the gases right and we know that these are made out of atoms right if you remove all these atoms from there you have fewer atoms okay we can't say that you have a perfect vacuum but you do have fewer atoms we can measure this okay and so now you have fewer atoms the question is the volume of the glass enclosure remains the same the volume of there is the same you have fewer atoms what took up the space where you removed atoms from what's in that space now are is it are there ether particles or is it totally empty space is there a vacuum there nothing by nothing i mean that which doesn't have shape okay 
And so this is the issue. The issue is whether there's something in there. And under the rope model, this has a very simple solution. Not for you to believe, it's for you to understand, okay? People say, oh, Bill, but do you believe? Yeah, I believe. I believe in this uh, rope model. You don't have to believe in it. You just have to understand it. That's important. People confuse believing with understanding. What you believe, I don't care. Uh, I just want you to understand, okay? So this is the rope version of what uh, I've been discussing with Mr. Um, uh, Christian Huygens and uh, uh, Torricelli and all these folks, okay? The atoms are still uh, forming part of the chamber walls. And there are obviously some, some uh, atoms inside the bulb as well. But let's assume we have a perfect vacuum in there. Let's say you, you achieve the perfect, there, there are no more atoms inside the white enclosure there. The bottom is a water, you can put anything, you can put mercury there if you want, I don't care. But the point is the white stuff there is total vacuum. Let's assume it's perfect vacuum. Even if you could achieve a perfect vacuum in there, totally empty space, you would still have the atoms of the walls, of the chamber walls connected to each other through the electromagnetic ropes. That's why light can still go through there. It has nothing to do with the white stuff being a medium. The white stuff is total vacuum total vacuum. Whether you have particles in there or not is irrelevant. The point is that even if you have no particles, no atoms whatsoever in, in the region where you see white, the atoms of the chamber walls are still connected to each other through electromagnetic ropes. So light will continue to go through that whole region. Okay. So you cannot evacuate the chamber. So it's not that the ether is there, ether particles in that region taking up the space left behind by the atoms that you pulled out. That's not the case under the rope model. You can remove all the atoms out of there, have a perfect vacuum. You still will have light going through there because light is a torsion that goes from atom to atom. Okay. Again, I'm interested in people understanding. Okay. And not in people believing. I don't care if you believe or not. My point here is that we have a different mechanism here. We're saying that if all atoms in the universe are interconnected and light is a torsion that goes from atom to atom along a rope, in other words, all we have is a torquing of a rope, and that signal reaches the other atom, the, especially the electron shell, gives it a thump, and that's going to be the, the sense that we call light, electromagnetism, sight. You know, I have atoms in my eye, and whenever light uh, the, the rope, you know, reaches that atom, there's a certain frequency, a certain torque, and that gives me a little thump, boom, 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 boom. You know, it gives me all these little vibrations, and that's what my eye sends to, you know, through the different mechanisms in my head, to the brain, and that's why I can see. And so when you have a chamber, like in this case, you have this bulb, uh, this, yeah, I'll call it a bulb because it's the uh, upper part, you know, um, the chamber walls are made out of atoms. They're not made out of hydrogen. I put hydrogen atoms because it's the simplest way to explain it. Uh, well, glass is SiO2, silicon dioxide. Uh, but uh, what is silicon? What is oxygen? Well, what these are is many hydrogen atoms lumped together, made by the stars. Okay. That's at least a theory, and I do agree with that one as well. Uh, essentially, the suns, the stars, crunch hydrogen atoms, turn them into helium, helium into higher, uh, uh, more massive elements, and eventually you reach oxygen and silicon. Okay? So now you have SiO2, you got glass, and they, each one of these contains essentially uh, many uh, merged or crunched or compressed uh, hydrogen atoms. Each hydrogen atom has one rope connected to any other hydrogen atom in the universe. That means if you have this bulb there, uh, or a glass enclosure, bell jar, whatever you want to call it, uh, maybe even a test tube, the, the bottom of a test tube, upside down test tube, uh, the glass walls are made out of atoms. And uh, you have this crystal structure, and each one of these uh, atoms is connected by ropes. 
So the ropes go right through the chamber. Even, even if you remove all the atoms from there, the, the rope is still there. And the rope will, uh, you know, if, uh, the atom is pumping, doing its quantum jumping, torquing the rope, and it sends a signal right through the vacuum. So yes, light does travel through a vacuum. In fact, uh, we see the Andromeda galaxy, and uh, hopefully there's not an ether there vibrating, taking us the signals all the way to our eyes. No, it's a total vacuum. What you have is an atom in Andromeda galaxy connected to the atom in your eye through a rope. And these torsions travel gazillions of years to reach your eyes. So it's just torsions throughout the universe. So it's a different model for how the universe works, how Mother Nature runs her shop. And again, all I'm interested in, you understand what I'm proposing. You don't have to believe it. Some people believe it and some people don't. Fine. Some people believe in God. Some people don't. You know, that's the way it is. Uh, so what you believe in is fine. You, you have your own beliefs. That's religion. I have my own beliefs. I have my religion. You have your religion. Here I'm talking about mechanisms. Why uh, Mr. Christian Huygens said, you know, I can still see light in this region despite that, you know, he thought they emptied the chamber completely, which is not true either. I, I'm a vacuum guy, so I can tell you, uh, you know, I pumped down to minus eight, minus nine. I think that's the best I've ever achieved, minus nine, and in a production environment. And um, there's still stuff in there. And maybe Christian Huygens would say, oh, you, you reach a total vacuum. No, <laughs> no, you don't, not on Earth. Uh, I don't even think it exists, a total vacuum, maybe maybe between galaxies somewhere, maybe there's a total vacuum where there's really no matter, okay? But the point here is that even if you have no matter, even if you take all the atoms out, you still have the ropes connecting the atoms, that's how light's going to go through. So you don't need atoms in the middle to convey light. You just need the two atoms and the sides, and those could be the, the sides of the glass enclosure. Okay, the, the, the atoms that form the glass enclosure. I hope you understood. If not, put a question in the um, Patreon site. And uh, if you didn't understand, I'll clarify what I can. We'll see you next time. See you then. Bye-bye.